Um, I'm going to read entirely from um, Bad Machine. It's a new book. It's kind of, that's partly its interest. It's a book which comprises about three or four different elements. Quite a lot of it came out of a collaboration with three artists, um, Philida Barlow, Caroline Wright, and Helen Russo, which went on for about a year and a half, um, just talking most of the time and looking at work. And I was quietly scribbling away and writing various things. That was one aspect of them, so you'll hear some of those. There's a bunch of poems here called Canzonis, which are a very ordinate kind of long and much fun, almost forgotten form. It was actually Marilyn Hacker who once who came up with the first of these that I remembered. Um, and the third part is a lot of experiments about language. The book is called Bad Machine um, because I'm thinking here of the body chiefly as a bad machine, but also of language as a bad machine too. I'll begin with two poems which are in some way unusual for me. They're sort of fables. This one's called A Man Without a Face. There was a man without a face. He could not grasp it. He could not imagine it. He could not see it. He swam through the air, faceless, like a bladed instrument, like a swatch of cloth, like stone rolling uphill, like a cloud seeing itself in a pond, like a likeness without mirror, like a word, like a shout, like breath, like nothing on earth. Am I nothing on earth, he felt his tongue asking. Am I feather or stone or leaf? Am I all fingers and thumbs, all arms and legs, all bone and no dog, all wind and no chest? He ached in the depth of his eyes. He hurt in the caves of his ears. His heart dragged in him. His liver and kidneys and pancreas and all his unnumbered organs were faceless and unnumbered. What is it to be faceless, God asked, since gods are not given to imagining? Here, take my face, said God. There's nothing behind it. My face is enough. I don't know what the fables mean. You just make them up and it sounds right. Um, this is some sayings about the snake, and this comes directly out of a work by Helen Russo, whose artwork in the period that we were working consisted of little graph paper borders. And this one just reminded me of a snake. And that's the connection. That's all the connection. Some sayings about the snakes. The snake is imaginary, even in life. We know it from a ribbon by its windings. We know it by its movement, eyes and fangs. We know it from the apprehension we feel dreaming of it. The snake arrives at dawn with the first light. It enters through the ear and exits through the navel. It coils itself within the gut and heart. The snake is a primal scream in the grass. It coils around the limbs of man and tree. It lives under a stone in the guilty conscience. It is necklace and armlet and bangle and song. The snake is the air in a hollow tube. The snake measures time the way man measures cloth. The snake spells out its name in the sand. The snake lives at the edges of life. When a snake enters a book, the book closes. Quite different now. The book has a number of flirtations with fable. So there's the element of fable. And you, I felt kind of drawn on by these things, um, just to see where they would finish up, uh, just to see if they would make a pattern to stay in my mind. This is very different. This is called a blue shirt. This is about a railway journey. Um, and it's a very crowded train. It's a perfectly real thing. And somewhere on the other side of the aisle, there's a, there's a person, a woman in a blue shirt, and she's working very hard. She's doing her extra work on her way back. Um, and I love the blue of the shirt. And at the same time as I'm looking at the blue of this shirt, I'm thinking how hard she is working and how much extra work she is putting in. And suddenly I begin to think that maybe this blue 
forgive me, is the color of the soul. So this is a, about the soul to some degree, as in a blue shirt. There are moments that soul exists as intensely as the blue of a shirt or the landscape sliding by a train window, not as an item of belief, but as a figure it might be possible to know, to greet, embrace, to violate or hurt in a space between love and grief, fine as a set of delicate wrists. And the notion that wrists might be cut occurs to you as a thought it is natural to think, as natural as a pen sliding across a page or the busy look of, say, a woman as she taps at her keyboard of no particular age, but still in a position to dream or sink into the arms of someone in an unframed future that is undoubtedly hers. Just so, Beethoven picks at the same scabs time and again, as if soul were an itch as real as the skin in which he squirms, in a time like the landscape that's gone in the dark as the train moves whose terms are echo and echo, as if soul were a rich relative you might touch for cash, or a loan to tidy over for a few unpaid tabs. And it may be the soul is coloured blue, like that shirt, which is as real as anything that music might dream of, or the woman typing might imagine as her fingers move over the keys till her work is done, or the vanished landscape that is about to sing in the dark while the soul lingers at the window seeking a frame to look through. Aridio Canzoni. Um, it's a 65 line poem in which words at the end just keep rearranging and rearranging themselves. Um, this is a title poem, uh, the title poem Canzoni, Bad Machine about the body. You will hear the words repeating themselves. It's a bit like throwing yourself into a spin dryer and then coming out slightly dizzy. Um, but it's the way, if you like, to some degree that form sometimes creates meaning or creates possibility. It's the longest poem, read it's 65 lines. And so they handed me the bad machine that seemed to me a miracle when new. This, they said to me, was the machine I'd have to play with now, this grave machine whose workings were beyond me. It was mine forever as long as any grave machine could be, since it was only a machine, albeit miraculous. And oh, the many parts there were to it. I could move whole parts and not even know that somehow the machine was on. They'll care for it, I thought. If care was what it needed, they could give it care. And yes, I did, in subtle ways, quite care. It was, after all, my very own machine. And others at first also lavished care on it. They bathed it, tucked it up, took care it should be sound, kept it as good as new, insisting in turn that I too should take care with all they cared for, such parental care being only natural. They called it mine, but it felt almost like theirs. I cried out, mine! It's mine alone, let go. They didn't care what I thought then. They played their given parts as I played mine. All had their private parts. It is a younger party that departs and so it was with me. I took some care to make the parting easy. So on parts, parting is all we know of heaven. My parts were working, I was the fit machine each chamber of my being, full of parts that wheezed and slid along with other parts. The bad machine was good, as good as new. I strode out, and the world itself was new, delightful with discreet and lovely parts. The way was open, and the way was mine to choose, or try at least to make choice mine. Then everything was mine, or beyond mine, and parts were lovely. I had seen those parts before in books and cinemas, that mine of images whose images were mine to start with. There was such tender care in them, with death enough to undermine all tenderness. I loved that machine of mine. I loved what it did, befitting a machine. I had no thought then of the bad machine, for how could it be bad if it was mine? It was the machine that was forever new, or maybe I could change it old for new. And yet, 
It was all new, or almost new, each time. My darlings and desires were mine to cultivate as I saw fit, as if the new were all machine and good machines stayed new. I understood the wearing out of parts as on another plane, as something new and still in a future tense. And it was new to me, the bad machine that tender care would not maintain, that did not care for me, bad even then when it was new, because that is the nature of machine. There's no machine that's not a bad machine. My darling, look. See, here is a machine, the bad machine that is our mutual care. I want you now for all those faulty parts that over years have learned to move with mine. Be bad with me, let bad be good as new. I'll read you two more so socially based poems. This one is called The Best of All Possible Worlds. You probably know the phrase um, from Condide. The best of all possible worlds is asleep, having turned in for the night. It is dreaming of snow a mile deep. The best of all possible worlds contemplates its own reflection in the mirror, its eyes to enormous plates. The best of all possible worlds is at the bus stop in a steady shower of rain, watching waterfall drop by drop. The best of all possible worlds is tired of waiting for the promised improvements. It has run out of things to be desired. The best of all possible worlds becomes a nervous, clumsy abstraction, all fingers and thumbs. The best of all possible worlds is a dark star in a universe of its own making, muttering, things are fine as they are. Things are fine as they are, says the sun on the wall. Things are fine as they are, says the cold in the bones. Things are fine as they are in the best of all possible worlds. And this is honor and pride. It's a two-part thing. We woke to find ourselves in a land of honor, the maps were bold but hardly accurate. The capital kept shifting and the trains did not run on time. We needed a leader to make it happen. We needed a leader to show us where honor lay. We needed the back streets, the alleys, the sewers of honor to be clean and presentable. And yet we were always aware of the nature and psychic geography of each of its cities. We lived them and walked them. We caught its night buses hailing its taxis. Beyond the borders of honor is a wilderness. Beyond the borders of honor, the creatures don't know their place in the peaceable kingdom, nor do we know it, we who inhabit it. I woke myself dreaming of honor, the peaceable kingdom, speaking its language, its impeccable grammar, perfectly formed in the cavern of my mouth, the attic of my brain, the cellars of my gut. So honor was mine, and the maps were redundant. So honor was spoken throughout the peaceable kingdom. So honor the omphalus, the lodestone, the center. So honor that most honorable estate where nothing runs on time. But the burnings proceed every evening in our habitations, our tunnels, in all the beautiful corpses of creatures in the words of my mouth. Something much, much lighter in a way. About um, 18 months ago, I had, a, I had a, an email from a museum in Belgium. This was a museum of shoes. And they said, could you send us your shoes? And I said, my shoes are deeply uninteresting. There's, there's nothing interesting about my shoes. And they pers persisted. And I said, no, they said, no just look at them. <laughs> they weren't there. Um, so I said, can you write us something about shoes? So this is called footnotes. Ha ha. <laughs> the last time I met my feet, they reminded me how rarely we got to meet at all, so nakedly and barely. The nails were hardly human, the toes were animal, my contact with my soles was minimal. It was a little like being an amnesiac. I couldn't remember my face or recognize my back. Somewhere in a morgue, raising a plastic sheet, a lost property clerk points out a pair of feet. The feet are bare as life and dead a distant moon. Dear feet, while you're my own, 
Let's meet again and soon. That's part of a poem, but I'll leave the rest of it. It's, it's fun. OK, this is something almost totally incomprehensible, but might be fun. I mean, I published this very big, fat, collected poems in 2008. And um, I haven't stopped being the person who has written those things. But it's just lovely to feel a kind of sense that one can explore the next field or the field the other side. This is called Colours. Um, it's a pair of, the first sonnet is unrhymed, the second is faintly rhymed. Over the last 10 years, I have written hundreds of sonnets to do with colours, um, just taking a colour and writing a sonnet or a sequence of sonnets on it, um, looking at the colours, often in pigments. Um, and then I began to fall for the names of colours. And this poem, Colours, the first part is just the names of colours. But I've made most of them up. Not all of them. And then the second is a kind of little reflection upon these colours. So, Burleywood, Chartreuse, Gainsborough, Ghostwhite, Greenberg, Maroon, Orchid, Mocassin, Peru, Demosthenes, Snow. Papaya whip, popper, peach puff, hot pink, hot hot, dark grey, dark grey, dodger blue, dragery, dari da. Fuchsia, fondle, fricassee, firebrick, fenfall, coral, corn silk, crimson, coleridge, coolidge, honeydew, hellbore, hartshorn, honiger, jet, jellyby, lavender blush, lascar, light cyan, light light, grey, grey green, garrulous. Go lightly, garrick, indignant, insolence, irked, ivory, ilk, jeremiah, asclepius, goldenrod, arivist, glock, cyan, chocolate, cadet, blue, camisole, fallen grey, flecked, lost blue, amaretto, shrubbery, yearning, absinthe, abstinence, grey holes in green. Had these been voices, the wind might have sung them through a hedge or an empty head. It was winter, then spring, then summer, then autumn, thunder and lightning, the beating of a red drum. Had it been blue guitar or a purple rose or a black Sunday? Had it been brown study, devil's dyke, or a dun as in dunnock? Had it been grey friar or red eye or a permanganate or a potassium? Had their names been their being? Had the retina been in service? Had the hot stores burned away with the seasons? Had it been anything but dinner in the provinces? Had the spectrum not gone awry? Had it ever fallen out like this, with a light lost in the jungle of the voice, with its brilliance and the dust? About three more poems. Um, this is... One of the other sets of poems in here is an engagement um, with the German artist uh, Anselm Kiefer, whose um, monumenta I saw in Paris and was moved to tears by these things. It rarely happens, but you know, sitting on a ledge of hiding my face. Um, mostly junk, but junk organized in a sort of extraordinary way. And I wanted to write a series of responses, which I've called mini menta because they're very, very small compared to those huge things. This is, in fact, a kind of elegy. It's called Allotments. It's in memory of a poet called Michael Murphy, who lived in Liverpool, a very talented Irish poet, um, who died young because of a brain tumour. And he wrote a series of poems called Allotments. Um, and I actually used some of his lines. And I'll just make a little hand signal to say this is his line. And I've integrated it. Um, so, oh, I should mention Bill Evans comes into it. Bill Evans is a jazz player, and you wonder why Bill Evans appears in a poem to do with allotments, and I don't know the answer either, except he, once he kind of appeared, he was there. And the poem sort of explains what is fascinating, not so much Bill Evans as a musician, but as a performer, because if anybody's seen him doing it, and it was did it ever more as he went on, as he sat at the piano, he looked down at the keys, never looked up, just like that. It was as if he were trying to look through the keyboard at his shoes. 
Um, so he, for some reason, that sort of image stuck with me. So it's in here. Allotments. When I glimpse from the train a clutch of allotments, a tight row of cabbages or spuds or garden peas, I think there are gods beyond gods who live in the bones of men and women, shivering at their touch, that when rain falls it weeps hailstones, that when Bill Evans lays his fingers down on the keys it is death he is playing in his own and the world's ear in a time allotted, in a proper undertone of fear, in each cloud that arrives with its gown of rain in a moment that bears no delaying, that the apparatus of the Perspex bus stop reclaimed for a hothouse is a new Jerusalem that is much like the old one, that each raindrop is a lifetime of damage and new life at once as it hangs on to the bent leaf like a lunatic in Hogarth's bedlam that these are the small, ordinary days we all know and live in, huddled inside the big ones, inside a cosmos we cannot quite inhabit, that we fall like rain every night, that it is the gods who are pleased to provide our allotments, here where one man lays out a row of something implicit in what it's not, that the twin tub bleeding rust and those prams with missing wheels, those tacit admissions, may still be useful, still full of purpose, still in possession of a certain will to serve, and not just rot and gather dust. What we learn once, that life being ordinary is the extraordinary thing, sticks with us like clods of soil trapped in the threads of our shoes. It is the plastic bags and shopping baskets we carry to and fro, those bags of manure, compost and refuse, the well-worn crust of the mysterious that wastes itself and comes round again. I think of Bill Evans' head, bent right down, staring, it seems, at his feet, not the keys, the salt lost spaces between head and foot. The loss bearing, the unsharing shared, the forgetting of cost as space opens up just where we stand, on the brink of music or earth, the universe of barren rock where everything bears fruit and nothing does, where the tune moves deeper, an inflorescence in unresolved chords with long lines of dock and nettle, and a faint occasional buzz of the fly hanging on the air, its brief dark presence zipping off somewhere by itself, into itself. These small constructions are scruffy Edens, those paradise gardens inhabited by gods much like ourselves, the books on the shelf, the unrolling of music, the curious odds and sods of a universe that demand our credence. They hold us for as long as anything holds. It is time to go. It is time to pack away the equipment we are used to, trowel and spade, and to turn off the music that still unfolds and won't stop unfolding. We cannot stay, not here, not anywhere we might have stayed. I'll finish with two short poems. This is called actually Yes. Actually, it's a double sonnet. It's about saying yes and saying no. Somewhere between the highly spectacular no and the modest yes of the creature's word arises and claims its space. No can afford fireworks in a grand entrance, but yes must go barefoot across floorboards. No can extend its franchise over the glossolalia of the imagination. Yes, discovers failure in a preposition impossible to offend. No demands success and receives reviews of the utmost luminosity, while yes is damned with faint praise. No profits by excess. Yes has little to say and even less to lose. The full Shakespearean ending is no with its raised brow. Yes disappears off stage and will not take a bow. Look, here's a very small yes. Now, watch it run its almost invisible race through nature. How does it know where to go? Where is it now? 
right there, just there. Like a picture of no one in particular, it looks surprised to be seeing itself approach a selfhood, hardly likely. See it hesitate as it approaches the sheer possibility of emergence on the very edge of being. Always off-center, its marginal affirmation of life's distant provinces will be rewarded with the briefest of smiles when smiles can be afforded, while monstrous no boldly addresses their nation. But now and then, the honest citizen will confess, when asked, to a weakness of sorts, whispering yes. Well, yes. Actually, yes. And I'll finish with this tiny little short thing. Um, again, it comes out of this collaboration with the artist. And he said, can you write abstract poems? I don't know. Um, this is called Say So. My last poem. If you say so, say so. If you don't say so, say so. If you say you say so, don't say you don't say so. If you say, say so. Don't say you say, just say, just say, just say so. Don't say I say so, just say so. I just say this. I say, I just say this, so you say. Say it, say it just so. Say it is so. It is so. If you say so, it is so. So say so. Thank you.